All right. So it looks like we're going to wait for just another couple minutes and we're going to start promptly at seven o'clock with all the fun festivities for tonight. I'm pretty excited uh, with all our panelists. Um, No, oh, let me. Okay, sorry. Music soft for a second. So I thought we were gonna jump in. But... Nope. Oh, all right. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Hey, folks, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, happy uh, Greek Orthodox Easter or Orthodox Easter and um, uh, happy Ramadan uh, for my fellow Muslims. Um, I am Michael Harris from Cape Cod DSA and my co moderator tonight is Carolyn um, from Our Revolution uh, Cambridge, and we will be uh, your MCs. Uh, we have a packed agenda, so we're gonna try to keep it uh, short for the intros, um, and uh, you'll definitely find something of value here. Um, a few sentences about the topic um, on community safety and health and alternative emergency responses. So I'm gonna pass it over to my co-moderator, Carolyn. Hi, welcome everybody. And we'd love to have you put um, where you're from in the chat. And um, you can use the chat for comments. And we're going to hope that if you have questions, you put those in the q and I I might have bumped ahead on that. Um, so this is an important topic, um, both because of alternative policing and all the issues it raises about um, ending and transforming policing, and also because they're really important community mental health issues. So we're hoping to cover both of those. Just to let you know what we're talking about here, we're going to start off with an invocation, followed by a framing of the issue and a historical perspective by Stephanie Gerard of um, Cambridge and Sean Donovan of Northampton. Then we'll hear about the programs underway or planned in Northampton, Amherst, Lynn and Cambridge. We'll hear from Representative Lindsay Sabadosa about a bill to provide funds for community emergency response services. We'll also hear about the police scorecard, which may help you build support for changes in your community. And then we're going to end with a Q&A for those who can remain on the call at 8. So welcome. Um, Michael? Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for some quick housekeeping, uh, each of our panelists will speak for about seven minutes or so. Um, if you have any questions during the forum, please type them into the Q&A um, and we will start answering those questions uh, around eight o'clock. Um, a reminder to all that this forum is recorded. So if you can please mute yourself when you're not speaking, um, that'd be appreciated. Um, and the recording will be available on uh, Orma's Facebook and YouTube page. And um, to Carolyn for the invocation. So I just like to, and we're very happy to introduce Chris Spears from OR Blue Hills, who will give the invocation. Chris. You're on. Uh, thank you. Uh, we recognize that we meet this evening on lands taken from indigenous people. We affirm our solidarity with indigenous peoples such as the Ashinaabe collection of Native American tribes, uh, as well as our more uh, local brothers and sisters, tribes such as the Massachusetts, Mashpee, Pakumtuk, Wampanoag, and the Narragansett peoples. We recognize that we live within the American capitalist system founded on slavery, a system that established a legacy of violence and selfish acquisition that includes mass shootings, racism, sexism, homophobia, support of oppressive foreign governments and economic inequality. We stand with the working class and their rights to dignity, a living wage and competitive benefits. Through forums like this one, we endeavor to educate the public on these complex issues by finding constructive solutions regarding a new way forward. Thanks very much, Chris. This forum was coordinated by members of Our Revolution and the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I'm going to say a word about Our Revolution, and Michael is going to talk about DSA. Our Revolution Massachusetts is organizing a grassroots political revolution to challenge power and to prioritize the needs of all people in our planet. We're building a statewide movement by fighting for economic, racial, social, sexual, gender, and environmental justice for all. 
We have chapters, local chapters around the state and a very active statewide organization. Some statewide priorities currently are climate justice in the Green New Deal, Medicare for all, voting rights reform, tax the rich and redistribute wealth and affordable housing. In addition to grassroots organizing, we work at all levels of government to elect progressive champions. To join us or contribute, check out the links in chat. Hi everyone. Um, so I am Michael Harris again uh, from the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, we are the largest socialist organization in uh, the United States uh, with about 92,000 members and chapters in all 50 states. Uh, our basic belief is that the economy and society should be run uh, and controlled democratically by all people. Um, and our goal is not just uh, the abolition of all classes, um, but the abolition of all coercive forms of uh, control, which is why we're here tonight and uh, happy to be part of this presentation. Uh, Cape Cod DSA has previously done a speaker series um, called Policing and Society, where we talked with policing researcher Taylor Wall, or sorry, Tyler Wall, um, who is the author of Police, a Field Guy. Um, we also spoke to comedian um, and former sex worker and current sex worker activist, Caitlin Bear, uh, Bailey, as well as Minneapolis um, abolitionist activist, Peter um, Van Nott. Uh, if you wish to watch those videos, you can find them on our YouTube channel. And if you're interested in joining uh, the DSA, you can go to, um, uh, you can look up uh, the DSA on Google and you'll find um, a local chapter to join. Um, with that said, I'm gonna pass it back to Carolyn. Um, so thank you. So the background and history of the drive to create new community health and safety response teams is embedded in America's structure and history. To aid us in understanding this story, we're fortunate to have Stephanie Grand of Cambridge and Sean Donovan of Northampton. Both have been instrumental in bringing changes in emergency responses in these cities. Stephanie is part of the Black Response and Cambridge Heart Holistic or Emergency Alternative Response Team. And Sean, as well, initially with the Wildflower Alliance and now as Implementation Director of Northampton's Community Care. Welcome, Sean and Stephanie. Um, thank you, you Car Carolyn. Uh, this is Sean, and I think Stephanie will join. Hey as well. Hey, I'm here. Awesome. All right. uh, give me a second, actually, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll just I'll just fill in while you're while you're finding that, Stephanie. Um, we wanted to give some frame to these conversations uh, because we're coming from different communities throughout Massachusetts, um, but we felt like there was a there was, you know, international, national, and statewide context to, to really lay out for for you. So we wanted to offer some of those pieces now. Great, thank you. Um, to begin, we want to call in some of our ancestors, um, those who have been killed by the police, in particular. Um, we want to call in George Floyd, Rihanna Taylor, Yuri Stamps, <laughs> Carmen Ortiz uh, Rodriguez, and countless others, um, we do this work in their memory. And um, we'd also like to call in uh, some of the names of people who were experiencing emotional distress, extreme states or mental health crises who were who were killed by the police. And so I'm going to read just a selection. Um, this includes Deborah Danner from New York, um, Terrence Coleman from Dorchester in our own state, uh, Tatiana Jefferson in Fort Worth, uh, Walter Wallace in Philadelphia, and then really close to home um, and close within this calendar year, um, Orlando Taylor III in Springfield and Miguel Estrella in Pittsfield. Um, and yeah, I just want to name, this is among countless others, um, but we also want to hold the importance of collective grief as we push for systemic change. And so we wanted to offer these names um, to share some of the, the, the context. And I know some of you are from Pittsfield, so I'm really glad you're with us tonight. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna take a quick pause. So 
we wanted to give some bigger context as well about why we're developing these programs, these um, responder programs. Uh, it goes beyond 2020, but we're going to talk about that as well. Um, some of the bigger context, at least in Northampton, and I think in a lot of places, uh, is that we're experiencing decades long defunding of social services and relief programs, um, mm -hmm. you know, that have had a disproportionate impact on, on poor folks and communities of color, the way that our country is set up. Um, so a lot of this response has shifted from social services to the police, you know, via the so-called war on drugs. Um, given that many people were um, released from state hospitals, especially in Northampton, and there wasn't necessarily like uh, relevant supports that uh, made up for uh, people leaving a place where they should be released from after decades long detainment to get the support they needed. So some of that slack was taken up by, by police. Um, and more importantly, um, you know, people were not met with enough housing and therapeutic supports, whether it was related to deinstitutionalization or just ongoing poverty. Um, and so Sometimes, you know, police are just positioned to, to fill in all of these uh, responses and um, oftentimes that has led to fatality and, and we just named some of the people that, where that's, that's been the case. So um, there's a bigger context though of, of, you know, what we're working with and I want to pass to Stephanie for some other context. Yeah, yeah, it's really helpful to think about these things as like waves of movements. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, um, we have been in the era of Black Lives Matter. And for over a decade now, we've been protesting um, state-sanctioned violence or the murder of, um, of people, community members at the hands of the state. Um, and specifically in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, the, the country, and some could argue the world, was collectively outraged by having witnessed the murder of George Floyd. And so then these movements began to make legislative change and to create um, and expand existing infrastructure for um, for public health safety and public health programs. But I just want to name that George, the call that led to the murder of George Floyd was not a mental health call. Um, and so we really have to consider that anything that narrows this conversation down to simply mental health is really a disservice to the conversation or an intentional um, sidebarring of what of the actual issues. Um, and I also want to say that the protests that grew out of the, the after the murder of George Floyd, the larger BLM uprisings of 2020. Um, allowed for the formation of lots of different organizations that began to advocate for um, the, the creation and implementations of these alternative public safety and behavioral health um, organizations. Um, in, in particular, I am I, I'm part of this organization called the Black Response. Um, we were formed after our city council passed a policy order unanimously to create a cahoots-like alternative public safety program. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that the most marginalized community members were prioritized um, and very much centered in the, in the conversation. That is the people who are currently underserved or sometimes even harmed by our existing um, public safety systems. This includes undocumented community members, unhoused community members, people with histories of incarceration, those who work in informal economies and all of their loved ones. Um, and I also wanna prioritize in this conversation that there are three main branches of the work that we're doing. Part of the work that we have to do is to continue to advocate for, um, for resources to be allocated to these programs that we're, that we're developing. And this goes back to the larger context that Sean brought up. The, um, the defunding uh, <laughs> happened to these types of programs over time, right? Through these uh, initiatives like the war on drugs. Um, and also there's the actual work and the work of like giving community care and making sure people have what they need. Um, that's work that's always been done in communities, especially marginalized communities. We know that there's queer history of we us taking care of ourselves. We know that there are communities of uh, low income people taking care of each other. So the work needs to be funded and supported and advocated for. But the part, the last part is research on these projects because the, the work that is being done in these communities are largely invisible to forces that can allocate resources to them. And so we, we, we need to make sure that we continue to advocate for um, 
resources to be allocated to these organizations um, by making sure that we support them by adequately researching them and funding proper research to be done on the, this work that we're currently doing. And I just want to make sure that we understand that this, uh, this work that we're doing is very much at the intersection of both public health and public safety. And you really can't untangle, um, disentangle the two, um, because obviously we know that, that someone experiencing a mental health crisis um, could also be, you know, someone who uses drugs or someone who's unhoused. So these things are intersectional issues and can't be boiled down to one or the other. And so the programs that we're going to be talking about today, um, a lot of the time address this intersection. I'll pass it back to you, Sean. Thanks, Stephanie. And yeah, I want to make space for uh, the fact that there are four uh, communities represented here. So we all might have different takes on this work. Um, but I, I wanted to say on my behalf, and I think Stephanie's too, we were thinking about the name of this event as alternatives to police, like capturing some of the picture, but not all of the picture of the work. And like sometimes not what we find uh, the most, uh, I guess, like transformative. And so uh, what's come out of the, the process in Northampton, which I'll address uh, more a little later, and I think a lot of communities is that, you know, we're not really trying to um, replace like, you know, policing as we know it with soft policing or something like that. Like we're, we're really trying to think about like what are community based first responder teams, you know, that can respond to some of the community struggles, at least in Northampton that we've identified that are related to so-called mental health and what gets classified under that in call types and dispatch in general is can be such a wide range of experiences, um, behavior, conflicts, uh, to address substance use in different ways, especially if people feel like family members or community members are using erratically. And what does that mean? Who gets to decide that? Um, community conflicts are things that I think a lot of our teams uh, are addressing and the struggles of houseless folks that often come into uh, conflict with other people like business owners. And we maybe can do you know, a better job of like not um, getting people entwined in law enforcement. So I just want to give one quick example, too, of we, we have, you know, crisis support services in a lot of cities, including Northampton, and so many of those people are doing great work and tireless work. Um, and I also think that sometimes it pits people to just um, be assessed and if they meet a higher level of care, which can also go to um, involuntary means, like sometimes people don't get a lot of support at all, uh, just because people are strapped and that's not the way it works. So I think of our programs as like working in this huge gray area to form relationships um, and to really figure out in the moment like what people need um, that often doesn't get uh, responded to, though there are great people doing that work. Um, so I'll pass to Stephanie for the next part. Yeah, I think it's really important for us to have a, a class analysis around this work. I mean, there's a lot to be said about this, but for the purposes of this conversation, I want to bring up two two key things. Um, obviously, as as you mentioned, Sean, um, conflict is inevitable, um, and so we need to consider why we ask for people to be reliant on police to solve their conflicts, both internal and interpersonal conflicts. Meanwhile, rich people or people with wealth um, have therapists and lawyers to mediate their conflicts and to, to keep their, their conflicts private. Um, and poor people have to um, rely on this very public system of conflict mediation, if, if we could call it that, right? <laughs> if that's what public safety can be, um, can be relegated to. So we really need to make sure that what we're talking about here is giving poor people um, access to resources to mediate their conflicts outside of a system that can also punish them for be, for being in conflict when conflict is is normal. It's it's part of being human. Um, for, that's that's only scratching the, the the surface of this conversation. There's another more complex um, discussion that we need to have about class, which is around the discussion of social workers and licensure. So um, I hope we can all agree. Um, yeah, I hope we can all agree that co-responder models for lots of different reasons, um, primarily that they default to untrained police officers as the authority in a situation. But for those reasons and many more, um, co-responder models do not work. 
And so a lot of people who have tried to push for closed border models have shifted their conversations to social workers. Let's get social workers to be the ones to be the first responders. Never mind the, con the conversation about um, uh, 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 mandated reporters and all of that. But for, for me, I definitely see the discussion of, of social workers, especially clinical social workers as a class issue. It's a class bias. And the, the mandate of having licensed professionals when we don't have um, ev even access to, to, um, to university, considering the astronomical price of university in the US. And then even when someone is able to enroll and pay for the university uh, tuition, there is not usually the resources necessary for people, especially caregivers or people with histories of all kinds of illness or physical and uh, mental to have the resources they need to get through those types of programs. I think Elham is going to touch on that a little bit later to some degree. And so for, for me, I understand this mandate for, for licensure as a class issue because it prevents people with lived experience from being the ones to have to hold the positions to support their community. So we very, I very much now speak for um, Cambridge Heart in this case, advocate for a, a peer response model that really pushes away the, con the conversation about licensure because we do value lived experience because of this uneven access to, to um, to university degrees. But I know you have more to say on that, Sean, I'll let you. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna move quick, quickly, because I think we have to move on to the next part, but <laughs> I just wanted to say um, another piece that I feel like is important, which is this very call, is though we are trying to make our programs community specific, it's also how are we connecting throughout the state? Uh, I know that talking to Stephanie for the past year has like opened my eyes to possibilities I didn't know were possible. <laughs> And I think we've we've given each other like some great feedback and just possibilities. And so I, I do want to move it to the uh, hearing from other people and like maybe Stephanie, if you wanted to cap it off, um, I'll try to share more later. Yeah, so I'll just be super quick. quick. Yeah, just add one sentence. For the purposes of this conversation, rather than talking about the national discussions around alternative public safety, that we're going to be focusing this conversation in Massachusetts and just between the organizations represented here. Sorry, Carolyn. No, no, it's fine. We're um, that's actually perfect because that is what the conversation will be, and um, I think that was really a great start to the conversation. And I'm sure it raised a lot of questions, which we'll come back to at eight o'clock. So, um, I'm going to move now into the discussion of the people who actually are creating these alternative response teams. And we're going to start with Earl Miller, who's the director of Amherst Community Responders, Responders for Equity, Service, and Safety, otherwise known as CRESS. So thanks very much, Earl. We appreciate having you. Yeah, thank you. I, I apologize for the awful Tinder picture. It seemed like a much better idea before I sent it in, but uh, <laughs> given the moment of looking at my own face, I might have sent a different one in. Um, hi, I'm Earl Miller. Uh, I'm the director of the Crest program. The entire name is a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, I just want to start by acknowledging that there are some uh, town councilors at this meeting. Uh, I see Pat DeAngelis. I encourage the rest of you to, to uh, give yourself a shout out in the chat. It's important. Um, the Amherst program uh, is maybe slightly different than what the two preceding folks said. Um, I was not a part of the town process. Um, I am a uh, guy with a job and some kids. So I didn't really, you know, I, I, I tried in the town I'm from. I'm from Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, I served for a brief period on our uh, police review board. Um, it, to me, it felt like that conversation was more about getting to know the people having the conversation versus having the conversation. I didn't find that as, as interesting as I found the work. Um, so for me, I recently came into this position. Uh, this will be the start of my sixth week. Um, Cress is a public safety department with the town of Amherst uh, on par with the police and fire department. Um, we are uh, funded by the town. Our salaries are, are taken care of um, and we are funded in part by some DPH grants. Um, the things we're doing are uh, I appreciate uh, Rep Sabadoza being here. Um, I, I took this from her. Uh, they're radical. And, and when I say radical, I mean grasping at the root cause of issues in our community, um, which are things like poverty, uh, but just not, not just poverty, but economic in, uh, inequality, right? It's one thing to be poor in a vacuum. It's another thing to be poor in a place where so many are not poor. 
um, to have your suffering to some degree thrown in your face. Um, we are working really hard to put together our team. In fact, we are uh, at this moment in interviews for our program assistant. Our responder positions will be posted uh, next week. Um, and we will be providing services in the town of Amherst uh, starting in the middle of June. Um, we are uh, all gas, no brakes at this point. Um, our goal is really to meet folks where they are. Uh, we will receive 911 calls. We're working with dispatch to kind of understand in what context that'll be. Um, but ultimately we wanna be as upstream as possible. Uh, you know, every 911 call to some degree is a failure of our society, right? It's a human condition that could not be handled without the need to call the municipal government to come in and, and handle some piece of it. Um, that is not exactly, I think, uh, what we're hoping for. Um, and so the town really gave us a, a mandate. We have a report from uh, this uh, LEAP report, which is available on the town website. Um, which really did recommend the situations in which we may respond to um, things like car accidents that don't involve, um, you know, medical need in which uh, changing information is really the kind of big piece. Um, working with folks who are experiencing emotional distress. Um, I'm, I'm, I just want to say that I think where we, we are different from what the other folks here presented tonight is that um, I think if, if you're a black person in this commonwealth, the way you experience services is dramatically different from the folks who put it together. Um, I say that as someone who uh, worked for the commonwealth for years um, and had an, uh, uh, an opportunity to see what happens. Now, when people talk about clinicians, um, it's important for us to know what a clinician looks like in this commonwealth. It is overwhelmingly the vast majority upper middle class white women. And those folks get to decide what your risk factors are. And when they show up for young black men, uh, overwhelmingly what that looks like is you are scary. We know that. Uh, we all just had conversations for two years about racial inequity. Everybody went, read white fragility. But when that white fragility determines where you are going to end up in the world, it is an unfairness. Um, part of Amherst hiring me that was radical is what you don't see represented well in these departments is black men in leadership. It's a conversation that we are unwilling to have as a society, is the cost of this on black and brown men. Uh, those two gentlemen we talked about in Western Mass who died were both black and brown men. Um, black people, black men, black women are half as likely to live in a place with a working mental health system and twice as likely to have a schizophrenia diagnosis. Um, our pain is, our pain is diagnosed um, and our, our, our circumstances are never changed. Um, so really at Crest, what we aim to do is, is to approach that, to be uh, transparent about what we can do, to be honest, to um, meet folks where they are, to, to do our best. We, the people who are hiring are really looking at this as an opportunity to change a part of the world. And, and I think that's what we have in front of us. But I think kind of my ask for folks is that this has to be beyond words. If you don't fund us, if we have to dance for our money every year, we will never be functional, not in the way that you intend us to be. I think the town of Amherst has done its best, but police departments are not funded by the municipality um, to the degree that we will be. They are funded by the federal government, by the local government, and by the state government. Um, if we have to compete with each other, um, I'll do my best to win, but that victory will mean another community lacking in resource. And police departments don't have to compete in that same way. The conversation around funding is the one we need to have. We will do the absolute best we can with the constraints of the money we have. Um, but if every year we have to stop doing the work to, to chase money, that will mean less work. Your local social service agency that you may or may not be unhappy with spends a lot of their time pursuing funding. Every minute we spend pursuing funding is a minute we don't spend supporting people in meaningful and impactful ways. Um, I, I want you all to feel free to reach out. Uh, as we get going, we want to be open-handed. We want to show folks what we're doing. But the big thing, if you're looking for advocacy points, is that at some point we will need access to the federal funding for community safety. We will need access to the state funding. And the time for kind of virtue signaling and saying this is a good idea is over. Come the middle of June, we'll be working. Don't support us with applause, support us with money, period. 
Um, we're going to do our absolute best with what we got. We'll do better if you help us. And if not, we'll do our absolute best. But again, this is your opportunity to join the set town of Amherst in funding this. And, and you need to demand that of folks, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Earl. That was amazing. And uh, it has been just uh, wonderful so far. Um, our next guest is Adriana uh, Paz. She is president of Prevent the Cycle and co-chair of Lynn uh, Racial Justice Coalition. She leads in the current effort to bring alternative emergency responses to Lynn. Uh, welcome, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Earl, for that as well. Um, good evening, everyone. As I as mentioned, my name is Adriana Paz, co-chair of the Lynn Racial Justice Coalition. Um, it consists of seven organizations, including ECHO, New Lynn Coalition, North Shore Juneteenth, Lynn United for Change, and Diverse People United, all working together on various police reform efforts in the city of Lynn. Uh, we joined together at the height of the pandemic and racial unrest in the country in 2020 to work on, a, on these uh, reform efforts in our city, including reevaluating uh, force use of force policy, implementation of body cameras, um, and the establishment of the unarmed response team, which we call ALERT, the All In Emergency Response Team. And we protested, we marched in order to force the doors open, um, government doors open, so that community voices would be front and center at the decision making table. Uh, demanding not only a change in how and what is police, but what, but also whatever form this program takes, wherever it is housed, be it a government agency or as we've been asking for, that it's housed with an independent nonprofit, that alert not be controlled by the police department, and that accountability for this program is to and by the community. Mm -hmm. And I want to stress that last part because we all know that far too often members of the community most affected by implementation of a program or policy are those who are least likely to have a voice in its creation or of said program or policy. Um, and we ask that this is reversed in when that the community's voice is in every aspect of this process and especially those who have been affected by current uh, policing policies. Um, and we want to specifically say our black and brown brothers or sisters, and unhoused brothers and sisters, and those who are differently abled. From envisioning to implementation to assessment, front and center. Full partners in determining what is safest, what is the most effective for ourselves. There are no better experts in those who, than those who live in the community, who will be affected by those programs, who have already been affected by police interactions. And to this effect, any action taken, um, reported or created that prioritizes community voices, unfortunately has been categorized by our police and those who support them um, as biased and largely discredited. They, one of the biggest issues that we have is refocusing and recentering uh, the voices of those most affected and normalizing that in this process. It's been incredibly hard um, it's been one of the biggest obstacles because even those who support our cause and support this program um, often find themselves centering police views and opinions throughout this process. Um, and so that's been one of our biggest, uh, uh, biggest obstacles. And in fact, police now, as they see that more folks are taking this seriously in Lynn, and that this is um, a serious, um, that this is actually going to happen, have in fact stepped in and said, they want an unarmed response team. They support it. However, they should control it. Uh, safety concerns, um, how uh, uh, the community is policed, they are the experts. They are the ones that can, um, are the only ones that can provide uh, a program such as this in the safest, in the safest manner. Uh, so we are encountering a lot of um, obstacles, not only with the police, but even those who support uh, our cause and don't see how their views are also um, um, prioritizing the police's views in, in the steps that we're taking, including in City Hall. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adriana. That was great. Um, 
I, I really, a lot of what you said really resonated with experiences that we've had in Cambridge. Um, I just wanna remind everybody, if you have questions and I really hope you do, would you please put them in the Q and A and not the, um, not the chat so we can find them at the end and make sure to try to answer them. And now I'd like to introduce Ilham Lazri, our next guest, who's um, one of the organizers of HEART, Cambridge's Holistic Emergency Alternative Response Team. Um, Ilham is responsible for the first team of emergency responders, which is something very exciting, which she will tell you about. Uh, thanks, Karan. Hi, everyone. My name is Idham Lazri, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for to implement Cambridge Heart. Um, the Cambridge Holistic Emergency Alternative Response Team is an alternative public safety program with a peer response model that would respond to emergency calls to address the immediate needs of people in conflict or crisis, including those with mental illness and or substance use disorder. Um, one thing that I thought was really important to focus on today was really to focus on the responders that are going to be responding to the community. So in the beginning, when we were doing this whole entire process, we started thinking really intentionally about who should be doing that peer response. And um, what we really wanted to do is make sure that the people who were responding to are also the community members that are marginalized black and brown community members um, community members like stephanie has mentioned with lived experience so during the whole interview process every single person that i spoke to have said i wish this program existed for me this is not just a job this is a passion this is what i want to do this is the work that i am doing in my community and so right now we've hired eight heart responders who are salary workers, most of them who have never even had a salary position and had having to explain what that means and walking them through the steps and being really intentional and in bringing these community members on as responders. That meant when we are signing them up for their first EMT, program, which they all had to go through, um, making sure that they had laptops, not assuming that people have access to the internet, making sure that they know how to use Zoom, um, going over online classes with them because the first eight weeks they had online class, talking them through about studying strategies and having study sessions for them. I know this might sound like, oh, why am I saying all of this? But being really intentional about who we bring into this work and make sure it has long longevity and that people have capacity and people are taken care of is really what, what's going to make heart super successful um, for example uh, last week we had a one week circle process um, with them they've never done circle process before and so we had to um, walk them through that and getting really the support that they need while building community um, also for the next five months, all of our responders will be doing training with organizations that they will be doing soft hands off with, that they're doing trainings with impact, uh, legal training, cop watch, and getting all the support that they need throughout their entire training. And I really urge, I mean, I grew up in Cambridge and I am a marginalized community member myself. My dad um, was unhoused and um, had to figure out how to get to a shelter without having to speak the language. So this hits very close to home for me. Um, and so we want to make sure that every single person who walks through hearts gets the support that they need, and that being the heart responders themselves. Um, I think that Stephanie wanted to take this over. I will pass it on to Stephanie. Hey, I'm having some internet issues. Um, right. So what is HEART anyway? So HEART is meant to be this peer response program. We are seeking to get calls. We're in the middle of negotiating with um, the Cambridge city government. Um, and we're negotiating call allocations with the city. That's been an ongoing challenge for going on a year now. Um, we don't look like we're gonna win any of those calls out to be allocated to us, even though the city has experience with um, 
um, negotiating with outside um, nonprofit organizations to fulfill the like to fill the needs uh, that the existing city departments aren't able to fill. We are not able, we're, we're not doing very well in those negotiations. Though the city does say that they are committed to finding ways to work with us. I could tell you more about that if you guys have questions uh, in the Q&A. But we're also seeking to get calls allocated to us through 988. Um, and that's a very complex uh, discussion to have because uh, 988 is meant to be this massive expansion of the uh, of, uh, of, of me uh, mental health crisis response program that's supposed to sort of mirror the, the immediacy of the and efficiency of the existing public safety um, approaches to to crisis uh, response, but uh, the implementation of it is really it's state by state, and there's not as much there's not as many resources allocated to it. And it I don't know what's going to happen by July 16 when the when everything is supposed to be rolled out. But for the purposes of like having community members reach out to us. Um, I know for us in Cambridge at heart, we are already receiving calls and we we aren't advertising that we're out, we're taking calls, but we're receiving calls from community members who hear about us from, you know, one or two steps removed from all of the members of uh, who have been hired. So uh, the responders and their community members. And we know that once we start really going out there and giving presentations about what we do, that we're going to get a lot of calls. We're in these discussions with the community about like who it is that we can serve and how we can serve them. We're still sort of uh, collecting data around that information. Um, we are talking to folks about um, how do we support an undocumented person? What are the needs of an undocumented person, for example? As a formerly undocumented person myself, like I know that the first thing you're never supposed to do is get anybody who you don't trust in your involved in your business and so if you don't have like a hundred percent trust in someone you're not going there and i also happen to have uh, family members who have been incarcerated and they share the same politics and the same approach to that they may not be having the same conversations as an immigrant you know myself um my mother is not talking to me about defund the police but she is not calling the police do you see what i mean and so the <laughs> language around these things though are are sort of um, siloed in Cambridge, and there's this um, there's this belief that there's only one perspective that that we need that there is there's either there's a sort of binary analysis of what is taking place in Cambridge, and there's not really space for for a plurality of understandings here, um, and specifically around. Um, like immigrant populations not being consulted in these things, especially if they're not Anglophone. I know Elham has lots to say about that. Non-English speaking uh, community members are not consulted in these things. And then if you're a, a low income immigrant person who's just trying to pay your rent, you're not usually involved in civic discussions. You're not usually um, sought after to be engaged in civic discussions. And you can see that with the allocations of all of these public task forces and things. The, the participation rates of non-Anglophone people are not even non-Anglophone Americans who, <laughs> who speak English. And, and especially in Cambridge, it's usually people with university degrees, not people who, I don't know, cab drivers, not the, you know, nurses aid, not the people who are doing ground level work and supporting the community who are not English speaking, um, native English speakers. And so we find ourselves really supporting that community who, and they are very much invisible in our community. And we're fighting to have the city see these people because when we're advocating in those spaces for calls to be allocated to us, and we're saying, no, we definitely do support undocumented people. They, they, the city is under the impression that they can serve undocumented people when we're telling them that they cannot. Um, and so we're really advocating for people to understand why it is that we created a quasi non-governmental organization that we want calls allocated to us from the city, but we also want people to come to us outside of the city. We also are very much adamant about not being mandated reporters and not working with the police in any way. And we're 100% about consent. 
when we let people know um, that like there there may be resources that we have to connect them to, but they those people may be mandated reporters, then we have to let people know that in advance before we hand them over to whatever services there are and give them the options to make decisions about their lives. These are the sort of things that we grapple with at Cambridge Heart and we grapple with them internally and externally. I'll pause there. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie and uh, Ilham. Um, our next speaker is Sean Donovan. Um, he's part of the fourth city effort that, or sorry, um, he's from Northampton's um, and he will uh, be our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Michael. And, and thank you everyone who preceded me, Earl, Adriana, Ilham, Stephanie, I so appreciate all your, all your thoughts on these, these pressing issues. And I'll try to be brief because I've already shared a bit in the beginning. Um, the Northampton process, just to, just to be clear, like we're still in the implementation process. So there are some things I can share with you about our, our process and some things we're still figuring out. Um, one thing I will name is that uh, our process in the city um, was unique in some ways. I think all of our processes, processes were, but um, there was uh, there were hundreds of community members that showed up at city council and then um, to, to demand changes to policing in the city. And a lot of these people are also folks doing mutual aid work uh, that came out of the pandemic and before uh, to provide support for houseless folks. Um, sometimes people themselves are houseless supporting others, um, drug users supporting each other. Um, so there's a lot of community members that are also have already been doing work outside of government and nonprofits even uh, that are still doing great work. And so um, in one of the groups that I was related to, which has been named is um, the Wildflower Alliance, which does some great uh, peer led supports. This is which is where I come out of um, my work around um, advocacy and psychiatric wards and the alternatives to suicide approach having non-force and non-coercion as part of our guiding principles. Um, and, and so when we, our city also had some commitments from the municipality um, in acknowledgement of um, the uprisings of 2020 and the movement for black lives and hundreds of community members showing up, um, they actually created a Northampton Policing Review Commission. And I, I wanna suggest that this was important on the official level, because it gave like uh, a forum for people to actually talk about what could be possible in the city, but it also allowed people that were doing some of the organizing and support work to, to find each other. I think that was a, a part of the pandemic that I felt um, was a really unexpected part of just like finding people doing similar work. Um, and so I did want to share a few, um, few thoughts from the public hearings that came out of it as it relates to our work in 2022. Um, but a local organizer in the houses community shared in December, 2020, that um, they were just in court last week for two trespass orders supporting houseless folks who um, you know, maybe were given these orders when they didn't have anywhere else to go. I think those are complicated situations, but it's, I think it's relevant to our current conversations. Um, a local service social worker in that same meeting said, I'd like to note that police and social services like, and I'm not going to name these, but a couple of local community mental health providers are all reactionary services. I would really like to advocate for peer led supports that are directly accountable to the communities and housing first programs that have saved communities money because they address a problem before it leads to emergency services being needed. Um, and then a community member said, I really think there's a big major problem with police responding to those with quote unquote mental illness. I suffer from complex post traumatic stress disorder and from a great deal of trauma from care providers and the police as an adult um, that further my entry into the system. And these are just three quotes I'm choosing to pull from uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of testimonies that were given throughout um, like a six month process. Um, definitely on these Zoom meetings, it wasn't accessible for everyone because uh, some of the meetings as some respondents acknowledged uh, were, were after the emergency shelter closed. Um, and some of them like, like folks in Cambridge are mentioning, like people don't have access to technology. So it wasn't perfect, but we got a picture of not just what needed to change in policing, but how social services were sometimes not meeting people's needs and actually getting people detained. Um, and so I'm sharing this because I, without this sort of ungainly process of the commission, I don't think we would have had things surface like that. And so as I started my job in the city in December, um, it was very much 
upon the Omicron surge. <laughs> and so it was really hard as a public health adjacent department to figure out how are we managing these, these dual crises. But a lot of the work the last four months has been continuing connecting with stakeholders that are mutual aid groups that are drop-in centers um, that are trying to branch out beyond you know, the city government and nonprofit structure, as well as meeting with the, the city and police um, and dispatch. And our model is a municipal based model that the um, Northampton Policing Review Commission actually recommended for our city because of some of the quotes that I just pulled. Um, they felt like maybe we shouldn't work with a subcontractor of a mental health provider because maybe we have to try something different. And maybe if we put it in the city government, it would have sustained funding. So that, those were some of the points from the policing commission. Um, and that, that's what I'm helping to work with now. Um, I will try to just bring it to a close. There's so much all of us could say. I will say just to echo Earl about funding. <laughs> we, need, we need more um, courageous funding. And I'm so grateful to have Representative Sabados on this call as someone who's um, offered a possibility through the ACEs bill, which I think will be addressed soon. Um, but sometimes our work doesn't get funded because it doesn't have capital B and P best practices, but a lot of this work hasn't had the funding um, to be verified you know, by Ivy League institutions because though, though we're pulling on decades and sometimes centuries worth of like community knowledge about how we support each other and keep each other alive, um, there, this hasn't been validated by systems. And so, um, yeah, just wanna acknowledge that that's so important. And so, as we move into the next fiscal year, we're looking for community engagement from a lot of different communities, um, undocumented, disabled folks, um, BIPOC folks. And one of the things that was a struggle this past four months was figuring out how do we pay people for sharing their stories and feedback. And so um, I can maybe talk more about that later another time, but I just feel like out of our conversations was also like, how are we actually paying tribute to uh, the people who are offering these, these, the wisdom of their lived, lived experience. And so it's really hard, I've learned, <laughs> to pay people through municipal structures. So we have to kind of figure out other ways. Um, I just wanna say thank you for the truth telling on this call and I'll, I'll, I'll pull it to a, a pause now. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. Um, up next uh, is Representative Lindsay Sabadosa. She is a representative of First Hampshire, um, which consists of the towns of Hatfield, Northamptons, Southamptons, Westamptons, and uh, Montgomery. Uh, Rep. Sabadosa is a strong progressive voice within Capitol, or sorry, Beacon Hill, and along with Senator uh, Sonia Chang, wrote and co-sponsored the ACEs bill, which Sean just uh, referenced. Um, which will recognize the money uh, to fund these initiatives and alternatives. Uh, so with that said, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Representative Sabadosa. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I feel like I need to do the compulsory can you hear me check because I am joining you from the side of the road um, in New Jersey, but I really wanted to be here with you this evening to talk a little bit about this legislation that I did file with Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. The ACES bill uh, stands for Alternatives to Community Emergency Services. And, um, you know, this is actually something that I was thinking about as I was running for office, um, just because of life experiences that I had that led me to think, you know, I, I don't feel like we're responding um, to crisis in the way that we should. And I have to say, I, I feel a little embarrassed joining this call this evening because I have heard so many people frame the issue in brilliant and articulate ways. And then when we bring it to the Massachusetts State House, I feel like I'm almost going to have to talk to you about it as if it were uh, 20 years ago, because that's sort of where the conversation is within the legislature. It, it's always a little bit more challenging. And I think folks talked about um, you know, this sort of drive to make sure that police voices are included. And that is something that we're, we're really experiencing in the state house as we try to push forward this idea. The ACES bill really is just a funding bill. It sets up a grant program to fund alternatives, pretty much like all of the programs that you heard this evening. Um, we do that through setting up a, a, a committee to, um, to vet applications. And we, I, I think, you know, Sean had sort of just said, well, you know, if, if things aren't aren't um, verified by an institution, then they might not get funded. We actually wanted to set up a committee that could verify plans based on their ability to have linguistic and cultural competence within the communities that they were trying to serve. So we were less interested in setting up a program that funds um, things that have been proven to work. And we wanted to do 
fund things that could work within a given situation. And the reason we did that was really because it became obvious as we were talking that there is no one size fits all model in the state. Um, I am from Northampton, uh, Senator Chang Diaz is from Boston, and we would often say, if it doesn't work in both of the communities, then it's not gonna work in all of the state and we can't put forward a proposal. So we wanted that community voice to be in there. And as we were writing the legislation, it was really at a moment where we saw a lot of um, things shifting on the federal level. So for example, there is, there was written into the CARES Act funding for states to implement these sorts of programs. Um, we are seeing this 988 number come forward. Um, and really, the, it's part of three pillars, right? It's that number, but then it's also how do you respond when you get those calls? And then how do you offer follow up service? And so this is the 988 number is step one, I view the ACES Act as step two. And Again, there are there's a lot that we're going to have to do. So the ACES Act would not fully address the problem, but it would offer that this is how we fund that response to those numbers. If 988 numbers are not answered locally, they are going to go to a federal number. And so that is actually it's great that it's not a 911 number, but it's still not necessarily solving um, or even attempting to solve the reason that someone placed the call in the first place. So where is the bill right now? Well, we're still in the public health committee. And part of the reason for that is there is a enormous debate amongst legislators about whether we should even be going in this direction or whether we should just be funding co-response. And that's kind of why I said, I feel like I'm bringing in the state legislature into the conversation that was year that should have been happening years ago, not in present time. There are a lot of legislators who truly believe that there is no way that we can move forward without having the police involved. We did see a program get set up that's called um, Equitable Approaches to Public Safety, EAPS, and I believe that's what um, Earl was referring to when he talked about the press program in Amherst because they were one of the programs that got some funding through that. That was originally funded two budgets ago. And then it got some additional funding uh, in the last budget, and we are fighting to even get it included in this budget. It came in on the House side at about 200000 But that program, as it's currently set up, first of all, will only work for communities that are going through their municipality. So programs like HEART and like the um, ALERT program in Lynn would not be able to apply for those funds. Even though it was funded at, I think, about 2.5 million in FY21, um, they were only able to fund five of the 12 applicants. Amherst got funded, Northampton didn't. Um, and then in FY22, one of the things that we saw were earmarks. So a thing legislators love to do, add an ear mark for your community and we saw that money get taken away time and time and time again for co-response programs in communities. Why is that a problem? Because we already fund co-response. We have a program through DMH that's called the Jail Diversion Program that offers millions of dollars and funds, I think about 80 communities across the Commonwealth. So taking money away from a program like EAPS to fund even more co-response is a problem. And Again, EAPS would not fund all of the communities that want to apply. It would not fund any organization that's not a municipality, and it would um, it would not uh, support things like regionalization or smaller communities that want to figure out solutions together. Plus, EAPS does allow co-response. So this is sort of a picture of what we're up against right now on Beacon Hill. We are going into budget debate starting tomorrow morning, which is why I'm going from New Jersey to Boston. Um, and we are trying to get the ACES bill included in the budget. And if we can't do that, we're at the very least trying to get the EAPS program to not fund co-response and to have that money so that uh, programs like the ones you've heard about tonight can actually get that funding. Um, but again, I, I really want you to take away from this evening the biggest hurdle that we have are that communities are trying to, that legislators and and some in communities are really trying to take that money away for co-response and it's an argument that we have to make that alternative approaches like the ones presented this evening are valuable and important and they need to get this money that the federal government has tried to give us that we've applied for that are part of the behavioral health roadmap and that might actually lead to some change so Thank you for having me, and I look forward to uh, questions. Thanks so much, Rep. Tabadosa. I I wanted to say that if you look at chat, you will discover links to um, 
connect to organizing around ACES. And also, um, if you're here hoping to start something in your community around alternative police response, there's a second link to click on to do that. So we urge you to do those things. You'll notice we're running a little late. Um, we hope we've been getting lots of raves in the chat. We hope you think it's worth it. Um, and it's definitely gonna be worth it to hear our next speaker. Um, he is Samuel Singh Yangwei, um, founder of Mapping Police Violence, a database of police killings in the United States and the Police Scorecard, a website with data on police and sheriff behavior. You may be surprised to learn that more than 90% of all arrests are for victimless crimes, such as disorderly conduct, loitering or sexual offenses. Knowing your local statistics might help drive your community to push for a change in response to these in community health and safety issues. So here to tell us about it is um, Samuel Singh Yangwei. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data around policing and police violence. Um, some of which you may be familiar with, uh, other data that is relatively new, just given the lack of data that's been available in this space and the recentness with which we've been able to obtain information, particularly on non-fatal police violence, uh, which is not tracked by the federal government, not tracked by most states, um, and even the federal government has struggled to collect data on, on deadly police violence to date. Um, so, you know, as, as was said, uh, I'm the founder of Mapping Police Violence. It's a project uh, that was started in 2015 in the wake of the Ferguson uprising and a realization that while institutions, while policymakers and researchers and people who had a lot of power and privilege in society uh, were essentially dismissing activists, dismissing communities, dismissing protesters uh, by saying, well, until you provide us with data, quantitative data on the subject, we're just going to treat this as a series of isolated incidents that's not part of a broader systematic problem. Um, and so my work was inspired by the realization that, number one, the federal government's not, collect, not going to collect this data for us. Um, we have to collect this data ourselves, and we have to use that data, um, number one, to point out how widespread the problem of policing and the problem of police violence is in society, how it impacts Black and Brown communities particularly, uh, and then also importantly, can help us data can help us chart a path towards solutions, to better understand what actually works, uh, what solutions may not work, um, and uh, to help us evaluate you know, approaches to dealing with, this, with the issues that police are currently being called in to deal with um, that ought to be responded to by a far more preferable uh, and unarmed uh, response that we've been talking about today. Um, so just to level set on some of the, the data and, and, and what it tells us, I mean, first and foremost, the scale of police violence um, is something that, that is difficult to even sort of wrap your head around. Um, you know, in this country, an average of three people are killed by police each day, um, about 1,100 people a year. And for every person uh, fatally shot by police, there are approximately two people who are shot by police and survive, um, and about 55,000 people who are hospitalized by police use of force uh, in any given year. Um, so we know that that violence impacts individuals, it also impacts families, it impacts communities. Um, we know research has pointed to a link between uh, community level or population level uh, mental health outcomes and incidents of police violence where communities that have higher rates of fatal police violence uh, for black people in those communities statewide, um, there are worse mental health outcomes overall because of the trauma of that violence. Um, so that sort of big picture, zooming in on Massachusetts. One of the things that, that we see when we look at the data in Massachusetts is that the racial disparities in police violence are even more severe, even worse than the national average. Uh, so on average, black people are about three times more likely to be killed by police than white people uh, per population. In Massachusetts, it's about five times more likely to be killed by police than white people. Um, so part of the, the work uh, to get to this point has been collecting data from local media reports, from public records requests to agencies, from existing local and state databases, and pulling that, that, those different strands of data together to better understand the issue of police violence. Uh, and when we do that, you know, one, of the, one of the things that, that I'm hopeful that you all will, will be able to use as a tool is this police scorecard project. Um, so, you know, starting with fatal police violence and expanding outward from there to co collect data on non-fatal police use of force, 
uh, on civilian complaints of police misconduct and the outcomes of those complaints, data on arrests uh, and what those arrests were for. So, so as has been said, about 5% of all arrests nationwide are for violent crime, about 12% are for property crime. The vast majority of arrests are for low-level nonviolent offenses. Um, so the police scorecard is a place to get all of the data that can be obtained to date on your city or your county uh, and putting that data in one place so that you can compare uh, the outcomes across the state and across the country. Um, and so that's the project that, that we've been building. Uh, and you know, thinking about moving forward, I think there are a couple of key uh, policy interventions and approaches um, that we're beginning to get some data in that might be helpful to you all's campaigns uh, to advocate for all alternatives to the police in various cities. Um, so I think number one, while 2020 was a year in which we saw a number of cities announce pilot programs that were mental health first responder programs, uh, you know, we saw this in New York City, we saw it in Portland, we saw it in San Francisco, um, we saw it in a number of cities in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to get now is some initial data, initial six month, one year, in some cases longer than that evaluations of those pilot programs. Uh, and as that data comes in, one of the things that you see uh, in many of these programs uh, are, are a couple of commonalities across the board. Uh, one, they're not at the scale that they need to be, right? I think uh, one of the things that we see, you know, even when we look at some of the more developed programs, um, so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, the Denver Star program, for example, um, you know, that, that has responded to over 2,000 calls for service involving mental health issues. None, none of those calls had the police come in for backup or arrest anybody or use force against anybody. Uh, it really is a, a powerful program and proof point that, that you can respond to 100% of these calls without the police involvement. Um, but even that program still needs to scale, needs to expand. Um, and so this is why investment in those programs is so critical. So in the STAR program, for example, they focus in, in, a, in a handful of target neighborhoods around the city of Denver. And currently they're responding to 29% of the welfare check, disturbance, suicidal or intoxic intoxicated persons calls across those, those few neighborhoods. So um, even the, the, in, in Eugene, the CAHOOTS program, um, citywide in Eugene, they respond to about 40% of the mental health calls um, in the city. So there's a lot of room to grow and expand, even for some of the programs that are more developed that have been around for a little bit longer that have gotten more attention lately. Um, and I think that's important to use the data to make the case for. They already have a record of success. They're already responding to these calls in many cases with 100% success rate and in not involving the police and in connecting people to services. Um, but they're just not at the scale that they need to be. They're not getting funded at the level that they need to be, certainly nowhere near the level of funding that you see going to the police. Um, I think the other piece about these programs is important when, in, in the data that we're starting to get back is that the types of calls that they're responding to differ pretty substantially across jurisdictions. Um, so in some cases, they are responding to calls that the police ordinarily wouldn't respond to. So um, they're responding to, to non-criminal violations or um, you know, animal control calls. Um, and in some cases, they're sort of being designated calls that even the police you know, usually wouldn't even show up for, would show up for. Um, so it's sort of an apples to oranges comparison around the results of the program. Whereas in Eugene, for example, they really are responding to a huge proportion of the overall mental health calls of various types in that city. Um, in Denver also, they're responding to a set of additional calls, calls involving people who, who have threatened harm um, for themselves, calls that are suicidal calls, for example, that other programs often exclude in the first responder programs. Um, so, so a big piece of this is, is learning from some of the programs that are more developed, that are responding to a broader range of types of situations, even situations where you know, the person may have threatened harm for themselves or others, they may have a weapon. Um, you know, things that are a little bit more challenging that cities would have you believe only the police can respond to. And yet in some of these cities, you do see um, first responders who are unarmed, first responders who are civilians um, responding to many of these types of calls and, and doing so successfully. Um, I think the other piece Samuel, of it is that I'm sorry, I have to ask you to try to wind up. Um, sure. Apologies. Um, no, absolutely. So, so um, the other piece of this is the funding. Um, so when we take the programs that have been developed that do have pilots in cities across the country that have published some sort of data on their budgets um, for the first responder, mental health first responder programs. In almost all cases, whether it's Portland, whether it's Denver, whether it's the CAHOOTS program, the cost per call responded to is lower 
for the first responder program, uh, the mental health first responder program, than it is for the average cost for call responded to by the police. So even being able to make like a fiscal case for this, um, the data now allows for, for that argument to be made, um, where it costs less to actually send uh, a first responder who's unarmed, who is a, a, a mental health clinician or, or a community member, it's less expensive to, to, to send that response than it is to send the police response, and there's a better outcome. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, even broadening our, our, our lens beyond mental health crises, mental health response, um, I think what is clear when we look at the data across the country is that, number one, the police are making the vast majority of arrests that they make are for low-level nonviolent offenses. And historically, and when you look at the data since 2013, cities that have significantly reduced arrests for low-level offenses have also seen significant reductions in police shootings. Um, and they've done so without seeing increases relative to other cities in crime or violent crime or homicide. So decriminalizing low-level offenses, decriminalizing drug possession, decriminalizing sex work, um, deprioritizing or completely decriminalizing a host of other liquor violations, violations related to substance use, vagrancy and loitering, which is often tied to homelessness, disorderly conduct, um, that is a pathway towards dramatically reducing police use of force in general, police shootings in particular, um, and the evidence suggests that that can all be done without any sort of negative impact on crime or public safety that the police would have you believe would happen. Um, so that's that's the picture. You go to policescorecard.org to learn more, and um, I'll pause there and happy to get to questions. So, so sorry to cut you off. I think we, we were overly ambitious in our program and we have so many wonderful speakers with a great amount to say, but thank you so much and sorry to cut you off. Um, and um, actually the transition is for Michael. <laughs> So Michael, uh, um, and I just want to say uh, Samuel has um, videos on YouTube. Uh, I watched uh, the, his TED talk earlier today as prep for that. Definitely that. And I have he also did a new school video, which is an hour and 40 minutes. I don't have that. That's on my tabs. But if you want to hear more from him, I definitely check out, obviously, the work he's done with the police scorecard. But um, check out those videos. Uh, I wish all our presenters had much more time because honestly it was wonderful um as a socialist for me it's always interesting to hear whether um folks will talk about class analysis and, and all i can say is our panelists today just i i think went above and beyond um and i want to thank all of you it was deep uh really um informational and you all did a fantastic job so um uh, I, I wish we could listen to each of you for at least an hour and a half, um, but uh, we're going to move on to the Q, uh, Q and A's. Uh, so, um, Carolyn, uh, I don't know if you have the first question ready. Oh, you're muted. Damn. Um, so I do want to say, I think we're dropping links in the chat to so that people can connect with both of our organizations. And um, we urge you to take a look at those links um, as well. We would love to have you as members. Both, both organizations would love to have you as members. Um, and now I'm going to start with the first question. Um, um, in these programs, and I'm sorry, I, I, it doesn't say who it's from, so apologies. In these programs, where would domestic violence calls be rooted to? What would a response to a domestic disturbance look like? And I think that. Stephanie said she might want to speak to that, and maybe others of you do as well. Earl, do you want to go first? I'm very curious. I muted myself there again. Uh, if you don't mind, just because I have a fairly quick answer. Um, one is that we've chosen in Amherst not to be so afraid that we don't do the work. Um, surely in domestic violence, there's what we, we classify as a crime, but there's also a victim in all of those situ situations who is deserving of support and compassion, and frankly, advocacy in those moments. As someone who's had the police show up uh, to my mom being abused, um, the larger question for all of these is when did we as a society decide that we would invite a person with a gun in every situation? Um, and as somebody who is watching violence in the home already, violence that is perpetuating in my life, 
escalating that violence by calling the municipal government does not make a ton of sense. At Crest, uh, we will show up to anything that uh, we think we can be helpful in. Um, and any crime or um, abuse against someone, there is someone in need of support and advocacy. And so uh, we plan to show up to those things. Um, I, I would challenge folks to not get so caught up in perfect that we don't do good. Um, we will fail. We will fail uh, in, in big places. Uh, so did the police, so did the fire department, so did every other institution of this country as it was stood up. Um, so we'll do our best with that. But the answer is we won't be afraid of helping people no matter where that is. That's, that's the Amherst answer. It's really good to hear you say that, Earl. Um, I think where we're at is, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to hear you say that. So we have a domestic violence working group um, and so in our domestic violence working group, we are talking to a number of different service providers in the city. Part of the work that we're doing there is sort of identifying um, the, the spaces that we can advocate for an alternative response, as well as learning how to facilitate handoffs to the service providers themselves. And I'll say that one early snag, <laughs> I don't know if you've come across this Earl, one early snag that we came across was um, some of the challenges around um, case management loads within the uh, service providers. So we we asked the service providers to help train our responders to identify situations of domestic violence, because we recognize that maybe that we would be called to, you know, any kind of conflict resolution or even a mutual aid situation and discover that it could be actually a domestic violence situation. And so that we are training our responders to be able to identify signs of domestic violence. And then the approach that we all agreed to at first is making sure that we, um, we make sure that they know how to discreetly um, give resources to um, the folks who need it, to people in that situation. And then we also know that because people need to it's, it's very, domestic violence is a complex situation and people often go back several times, six, seven, eight times. And so that we wanna be able to support people in that moment, like give, if someone is like, I'm ready to go, take, transport them to wherever they go, they want to go or um, also allocate resources to that. Like if someone needs to have a safe home right away. The other thing is like, when we're talking to those um, service providers, we recognize that the, the parts of the intersections where, where an alternative public safety program could intervene in taking resources away. And this goes back to the class analysis. I'll try to say this quickly, but um, that, that if, if a call is tagged as a domestic violence call through 911, uh, through dispatch, right? They triage the calls. Um, that call remains, that case remains with the police department in their domestic violence division. And then that, um, the domestic violence division of the police department will uh, contract an agency to advise them. But because of the way um, budgets are written, the police departments can only pay for certain types of things. And that doesn't include a hotel for someone to stay in or food for them or anything like that. And so then those domestic violence agencies are actually having to pay for those things, right? And then I want you to also consider the fact that um, if there if it's a whole family that needs to be transported and that and there's a child that needs to go to school or something um there's not like a sub department within the police department that's solely for transportation for example right so then what ends up happening is that um the people sign up for tasks which then are actually paid overtime to police officers and so those police officers are being paid to take someone to target to buy clothes or take a child to school because they need to and nobody's being asked if they want to have that attention drawn to them and the police officers are being paid extra money that could be allocated to an otherly marginalized community member through um, an employment program like an alternative public safety program that's just one example but I'm there those are the types of conversations that we're having in our domestic violence working group. And I'll, last thing I promise, um, that we are working with Creative Interventions and Mimi Kim to facilitate a long discussion, like a large scale. We were allocating um, six hours to a discussion to find like very concrete suggestions for how it is that we can intervene in domestic violence response. I'll, I'll be quiet. I just want to one, one more piece just to tag on that. 
I wonder why we're being asked to answer every potential scenario we might engage with before we do the work. Um, I, my, my answer to most of these questions is we will start working in June. We will be brave. That's what our community demands of us. Um, and we won't be afraid. Now, if we're inappropriate or the person responding wants someone else, um, part of enthusiastic consent, which we're looking for, is going to be that if the person we're showing up to would like a different town agency to show up, then, then absolutely, we'll facilitate that. But I just wonder why we, and because and this is my second panel of the day, my probably 30th panel of the month, and every one of them I'm asked to answer for a hypothetical scenario mm -hmm. that has not come up. And my, my answer is that we will be compassionate and empathetic. We will hold equity um, and public safety and all those things. My job as the director of this program is that my folks go home safe at the end of the day. I'm committed to make decisions that end with everybody going home. But I just want to push people away um, from, from asking us to answer for these hypothetical situations that no other public safety structure was forced to answer before they started working. So I'm hoping it makes sense to just move on to another question, but let's see if we can tap some other of the panelists in the course of doing that. And Michael, I think you have the next question to ask. Yeah, and uh, thank you for uh, um, Earl and Stephanie for answering that. Um, so this question is from uh, Shannon uh, Ga uh, Gamble. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, I know the co-responder model has problems, but isn't it a good first step? it does prevent people from being sectioned by uh, police because the social worker is there to offer other options, especially for small towns who can't get funding for programs like Crest. It's far from perfect, but it's better than the current situation. I forget, um, it doesn't have a person that was directed for, but I forget who mentioned that. Um, so uh, whoever did, if you can go first, or if anyone has something they wanna say, oh, Earl, um, I, I promise to stop talking at some no, point here, but I, I just want to answer it. this because um, I, I have spent the last four years of my life sitting in, in public mental health. If crisis services could solve these problems, they already would have. Um, we, we don't exist because the structures that exist are doing too well. Um, crisis struggles to find clinicians. They struggle to deploy them. Uh, when they deploy again, it is white upper class middle women, uh, upper middle class women showing up to the homes of poor people, and then being asked to determine if risk exists in a community that they would never drive through in their personal time. So of course it's risky. It the Orlando and Springfield, the crisis pro provider was was alerted to this man's existence days ahead of time. Um, I, I recognize that co-response makes folks feel good. And I think there is some value in it, right? I think all of these things have some value. Um, but if you think that the black and brown community is served well by co-response in this, in this commonwealth, um, you're wrong. You're, you're just wrong. Ultimately, what it ends up looking like for folks is that maybe a social worker shows up to my house. Probably not. But in the event that they do show up, I'm going to be put into an ambulance with the police there. So at gunpoint functionally, I'm gonna be taken to a hospital that won't have a bed for me for days if I'm lucky, weeks if I'm not, months if I'm on the fringes of that, I'm gonna sit in that emergency room and I'm not gonna get better. Uh, it, there is no difference between sitting in an emergency room being hoteled and isolation in any other sort of carceral institution. And so if we wanna keep increasing funding the crisis, that's fine. That's something the Commonwealth has done. Crisis is funded far better now than it was when it first started. Co-response is funded far better now than it ever has been. Here's what I can say. When I go around Amherst, the, the thing that they say to me is we want to be, we want an agency that is accountable to us, that 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 holds our truths, that we can speak to. Um, and, and the reality is I think crisis does the best it can with its 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 limitations. But the idea of what is going to be construed as mental health crisis versus crime is in a context. And, and, and to hear what, what the, the, the crime stats are, black, black despair is criminal in this country. It always has been. From Quack Walker trying to, to escape uh, slavery through the criminal justice system, through, the, through the, the court system here, 
This is a thing that we have been doing for hundreds of years, and it plays out the exact same way every time. If we're going to be radical, let's be radical. If you want the same structures, those existed in, uh, in, in uh, the summer of 2020. If they were the solution to our problem, they wouldn't, we wouldn't have ended up in those spaces. And by the way, they exist all the way in this country. If you go to Denver, uh, Elijah McClain um, was, was, was injected with medications by EMTs who had had crisis training. Um, to, to pretend like these panaceas are going to ultimately solve things, they don't. Um, so what I would encourage folks to do is, A, have a little bit of imagination and talk to people who have been served by these situations. Because frankly, um, if a social worker shows up with a cop, uh, they can be the best social worker in the world. Whatever exchange we have is at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't have too much to add to what Earl shared. Thank you so much, Earl. I, I do wanna uh, address some other questions that are related real quick too, from Pittsfield, et cetera. Um, the other piece about co like resting on co-response, just to play on what Earl was sharing too, I think it plays on this fear response of suggesting, you know, like, we, we don't trust people to be able to respond in a different way, but we have a lot of wisdom in our communities. When we talk about lived experience and perhaps even peer-led responses, you know, we're talking about people that have some of the experiences, like myself being institutionalized or people being held at, you know, at, you know, taken uh, into custody by police because of racial profiling, et cetera. Like people, we know how to support people differently. The other thing I wanna just emphasize too, um, with a lot of these uh, shootings that are so tragic, um, there's a bigger story there, like Earl was mentioning. And so like um, in a lot of cases, like crisis response doesn't have a lot of resources. And so they mm -hmm. often are using a risk management tool that says they're either on one side of the equation where they need a higher level of care because of uh, assessment of risk to self or others. And sometimes that's forceful and voluntary or they're kind of assessed that like they don't need anything. And that's what happened in Springfield and other places. And, and even if it hasn't happened, like someone hasn't been killed in our communities, I don't think our threshold of change should be, should be death. Like, although it has been, you know, in our national scale. So I just, I think that there's, um, when I worked with Wildflower Alliance, sometimes we didn't have like, you know, best practices, Harvard research studies to say, this is why our approach of non-coercive support works. But we had so much compelling counter evidence to say, what's the risk of not acting? Just to emphasize some of what Earl said too. And um, I do think when talking to legislators, I saw a question from Pittsfield, like um, to have like community responder teams that have a clear purpose um, to act individually is like uh, another version of like saying not co-response. And, and just to, yeah, I'm just repeating some people what, are, what people are saying, but in our local area, we have more funding for co-response than people are willing to take the jobs too. <laughs> and so I feel like in addition to the actual um, ways of support not really working, like I don't think people want the jobs. So maybe we should like offer jobs that people actually feel like they're able to fulfill. And so in, in our community, like I'm not trying to recreate police or crisis services because we have that. <laughs> You know, we're trying to figure out another way, and as I know all of you are in different ways. So, um, thanks for the questions. Um, Ilham? Yeah, I just wanted to add a really quick uh, thought. I think it's really important to mention as somebody who is from the community in Cambridge and someone who's always talking to the community, um, what a lot of people are saying is that they need a program that they can trust. They need somebody to be able to call when they're going through a crisis and it's never the police for them. And so I think a lot of times people think, oh, you know, like the heart and the police, but actually we don't talk about the police at heart because they don't do the crises that we will serve. They're not dealing with people who are sleeping in ATM machines. They're not dealing with unhoused populations. They're not dealing with immigrants. They actually, most of the people that we're servicing at heart and talking to at heart don't see the police as an option at all. So for the people who are constantly afraid and in, in dealing with hypotheticals about, oh, um, we need to be, we like what happens if, you know, um, this and this happens to me and like I call the police and blah, blah, blah. If that is the case for you, if you trust the police, call the police. Heart is not for you. <laughs> but for the other people who actually don't have that option, we're mm -hmm. saying that there's a huge demographic 
of community members who that 911 does not exist in their phone. Like they will never dial it. It actually brings fear. And so those are the demographic that we are trying to serve, the ones that don't have an option. I recognize that we're trying to answer a lot of questions today, but these two questions are the foundational ones. So if we spend a little bit of extra time on them, um, I think this is the answer for your legislators, because these are the questions that are going to come out, is why fund these and mm -hmm. not co-response? Um, and and there's you've heard a lot of reasons. But the other piece is ask your municipal government how they feel served by crisis. Ask your local hospital how they feel served by crisis. Ask the folks who receive mental health services how they feel served by crisis. The reality is that at this current moment, we are all gonna run up against the lobbying efforts of large mental health providers who are incentivized to get these massive state contracts. That if you talk to folks, what I've never heard is someone say, hey, I'm not worried about Crest, man, really crisis, crisis, they got me. Things come up, uh, social worker is gonna show up and, and take care of things. I just wanna be clear that this is one of the big questions to talk to your legislators about. Ask them to talk to their constituents about how well they are served by crisis. I, I think we win that battle, uh, but I, I think that's what, what we need to do is ask folks how they feel served. But I think Amherst, we're in a different space. I don't think there's this huge backlash with our police department, partly because our police department is a little different. They haven't pulled the gun in at least 50 years, but <laughs> folks don't exist in a vacuum, right? When they watch what happens in other towns, they are aware that this could happen. People want something different. And every time our communities ask for alternatives, what they get is a slightly different version of the same thing. And if you remember what happened historically in this country, last time we stood up a new public safety department, there was the police and the fire department shooting at each other in front of burning buildings. Do not make us battle other public safety organizations. Let us stand. Fund us in isolation. Um, the more we have to battle with these folks, the more time and energy wasted. So we're supposed to, at this point, move on to another question, but we're also, um, I think, moving towards the very end of things. So I'm looking for a little guidance from my um, bosses here <laughs> about, um, about what to do. Is it reasonable to go for five more minutes and try to squeeze one more question in? Henry? <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead and do one more question, Carolyn, and then if okay. folks can try to uh, wrap up a final word in the okay. answer, that would be ideal. Okay, it's just such a privilege to have you all, I want to say, and it's been an incredible discussion. This is a question for Samuel, so um, um, this is from Alex. <laughs> um, and it's raised because people always bring it up to our exposure to pervasive co-propaganda. How do the numbers of police killed in the line of duty compare to the stats you gave us? Yeah, so um, it's a great question I, and it definitely gets raised all the time. Um, so this is actually a more difficult to answer question than it seems in part because the way in which police officer deaths on duty are counted depends on the organization counting them. Um, and I say this because over the past two or maybe even three years now, the number one cause of death for police has been COVID. Um, and so there are some organizations like Officer Down, um, the Officer Memorial Fund that count that as line of duty deaths, um, in which case it like massively inflates the number of officers who are killed in the line of duty. Um, on the other hand, it also demonstrates that, you know, the, that the threat from you know, these doomsday scenarios that you hear from the police of, you know, people who are armed and threatening them or attacks on the police or ambushes on the police, things like that are highly infrequent. Um, and they're not even like, you know, they don't even touch the top cause of death for police, which is actually a public health issue, which is COVID. Um, so, I mean, it depends on the on the the way that it's counted, but in, in, in every way in which it's compiled, there are substantially more people killed by the police than police killed in the line of duty or shot or harmed in the line of duty. Um, one of the things that that is, and this goes to the previous conversation, uh, or the previous question um, around these sort of, the specter of this doomsday scenario that the police will give you as a way to prevent any type of progress from being made or prevent any type of law from being passed. They'll essentially try to give you the worst case scenario. They'll say, you know, why, 
we have to have armed police to do traffic enforcement because, you know, there'll be that one person, that one car that we stop and they have a gun and they pull a gun or there'll be a mass shooter and we have to respond to that. And it's, it's everything is taking like the absolute worst case scenario and depicting that as something that our entire organization, entire city, entire budget has to be organized around dealing with this one hypothetical rather than looking at the actual data and saying, you know what, it turns out the vast majority of what police are doing has nothing to do with violent crime. It turns out that you know only about 4% of what police spend their time doing involves responding to violent crime. It turns out only about 1% of the arrests that police make are for homicide. It turns out that what police actually do with their time overwhelmingly is stop a whole bunch of people and arrest some of them for a host of low-level infractions and low-level offenses, most of which have to do with substance use, have to do with poverty, have to do with homelessness, have to do with sex work, have to do with uh, liquor and liquor violations, substance use, a whole host of things that ought not even be crimes, ought not to, ought not result in folks getting put in cages. Um, so, so I think you know those issues will be brought up. There will be these sort of doomsday scenarios. One of the things that that can be helpful though is to have that data handy because you can always anticipate this argument coming from from the other side. And if you have that data handy, you can say, you know, if you have the calls for service data, if you don't have it, you can do a public records request on muckrock.com, get the calls for service data from your, your city um, and do that, and dive through it and see, you know, it turns out that of all of these calls that police were called into dealing with, you know, mental health calls, um, it turns out that there were very few cases that actually resulted in any type of danger to an officer, any type of officer saying that they were confronted in the way that you've proposed is, is commonplace, which it's not. Um, and that's a strategy that, that I've seen work in some cities, you know, Ithaca, um, you know, they proposed a new model uh, where they were going to detach a whole bunch of different functions that currently the police were doing um, and create unarmed responses that were not the police to those types of incidents. And to move that proposal through, um, one of the things that was critical was having the data um, to actually push back against those doomsday scenarios. So like on traffic enforcement, people would come with that argument that, you know, every once in a while you're going to stop somebody who's armed and the police need to be armed. And they looked through the data for every traffic stop that involved that type of infraction, not one, and not one of those incidents had any of that ever happened. And so you can, you can push back, but you gotta be prepared with that data because otherwise it becomes like a, your word against their word, they're the police, they know the story of some, some anecdote about this one officer who did this one thing. And so then it puts you in, in, in not the best position politically, I think having that data handy on the front end um, is critical. And if you need help getting it, like happy to, to help collect that data or, or, or do an analysis that can help show those things. So this is where I'm supposed to say it. it looks like we've covered all our questions. And as you may know, if you ask questions, we didn't. <laughs> and so first of all, apologies to everybody whose questions didn't get answered. Um, I'm hoping we can save them and maybe figure out some other way to um, add. Stephanie, I see you want to add in, but I'm told I have to wind it up. Um, is that we? I think I think we have to wind it up because we're way way over. Um, so let me just say it was a pleasure um, having you all here. Um, I've been working on this issue for a while, and I learned a tremendous amount tonight. And it, it's just a privilege to listen to you all. And um, thanks everybody for coming. We had a great crowd, and glad to have you. Good night. <laughs>